Good morning. Uh, today we're with David Tao, founder and CEO of Barbend. Uh, David graduated from Harvard, which is pretty awesome, uh, in a fitness and strength uh, new site, Barbend. He has over 1 million monthly visitors and is the official media partner of USA Weightlif Weightlifting, the sports national governing body. In addition to his work building online brands, David has been a writer for Fortune.com, as well as a contributor to Forbes.com, Slate, and numerous other outlets across the web and in print. Uh, you're also a voice actor, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I want to talk about that, too. Um, so you went to Harvard. What, what were your plans when you were, when you were in college? What did you want to do? Um, well, I initially actually applied to law school while I was in college um, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do necessarily. So I was like, oh, oh, a bunch of people are applying to law school. This was after or kind of during the, the financial crisis, uh, you know, between 2008 and 2010. And everyone said, well, they're always going to need lawyers. Well, it turns out everyone had that idea. So everyone applied to law school. So uh, there was a bit of a, a glut there. So I, I thought maybe I want to be a lawyer. Uh, I did always have a passion for journalism. I ended up getting into law school, but deferring for a couple of years, did not end up going back, uh, but ended up moving to New York and became a business journalist. So my first job was with fortune.com writing on, you know, everything that you could classify as business journalism, kind of everything under the sun there. And, um, you know, I was, uh, had a column at, at the at school newspaper in college. I was always really passionate about writing and really wanted to hone in on journalism it was a great outlet for that. So I'm still very much in the journalism space today. I'm doing a little less writing myself. Um, the title I actually like to use is, is co-founder of Barbend and editor-in-chief uh, because I do spend most of my days in an editorial capacity. So I still get to scratch that itch just in, in a little bit of a different way now. You went, you went to Harvard, which is just um, you know, a, a very well-known prestigious school um, to be a lawyer, correct? And then you switched while you, you switched while you were there? Well, there is no undergraduate law program. You, you don't, I mean, I applied to law school, actually got into Harvard Law School and wow. ended up deferring. Uh, but I, so I, went, I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. Um, so, you know, you, you, don't, you don't become a lawyer as an, under, as an undergraduate. So, gotcha. um, you know, I, I just went there for more of a general liberal arts education. And how did you end up in New York? I always wanted to move to New York. I grew up in a, a small town in Kentucky. And New York was always, you know, a big city. It's, it's it's where the movies are set. It's where all the excitement is. I knew a lot of people from New York from college. Um, I had spent some summers in New York during college and, you know, internships and summer jobs. And I always thought that I, I wanted to move to New York for at least a period of time, right? See what the see what the hubbub's about. See see what all this is about. See if it kind of lives up to uh, to expectations. And I very much fell in love with the city pretty much immediately upon moving here. I, I, I really loved the fact that I could be around so many people. I could connect with so many people, although that's not always super, super easy in New York. People do tend to mind their own business sometimes. And I liked that everything was just kind of a, a fingertip away or, or a couple blocks away or a short subway ride away. You know, you can go see great art, shows. Um, it's a hub for, for media, right? I think founding a, a media company in New York has a lot of advantages. It's not a cheap city, but at the same time, there's a very, very large people who want, want to create big audio uh, products and things like that. So, you know, New York was like, hey, let me just try it out. If I don't like it, I can always move. And, uh, you know, I really haven't left since. And you're close to everything. So we're, we're not too far from you. We're about, an, I don't know, about an hour away until we hit your traffic. And then we slow down a little bit coming into the city. Um, so the the different magazines that you worked for, um, what were the what were the benefits and, and and minuses to each, and differences really? Yeah, so, yeah. So I I started working, uh, you know, after after college was kind of for me during an era of print consolidation and when a lot of print publications were struggling. Um, People were publishing, you know, weekly magazines were moving to bi-weekly. Some magazines were shuttering. Some were going online only. And it was a weird time when people weren't really sure how things were going to pan out in the digital versus print space. Obviously, it's digital for few, if any, print-first publications left. <clears throat> That's just the way. And so I, I think it was a bit of a tumultuous time. I think people were, you, you, would, you would go into a publication <clears throat> like a fortune, and you would see different teams. It'd be like a Fortune.com team and a Fortune print magazine team. And there, and when I 
was first getting involved in media, I started seeing more crossover between the two, right? The, the lines became blurred between the website team and the print publication team. Now they're just kind of one and the same and it's all website first, right? It's digital first, even if companies are still <clears throat> printing magazines. So I'm thankful that that was kind of early on in my career that I got to see that and, and witness that. I feel felt very strongly and and still feel very strongly for the people who were kind of mid-career or late career in that industry going through that because I think there were a lot of questions that people had to ask themselves around, well, what's my place? What do I want to do? People who are magazine journalists for decades, well, if magazines aren't selling anymore and if, if blogs are kind of ruling the roost, what do you do? What? How does your career evolve? You know, is there a place for long-form magazine journalism? And I think now we're kind of on the other side of that. There is, there are websites that produce amazing long form content. It does quite well and they're rewarded for it with traffic and visibility, and et cetera. But there was a time when, when I think a lot of people who worked in magazines and had been for decades were really kind of scratching their heads and saying, you know, is this it? Is it over? And it was much easier to be early on in my career and be fluid and be able to kind of be flexible as far as what I did and what I was interested in, as opposed to those folks who had already, you know, given so, so many years of their prime uh, working life to that industry. With, with those people, did you have a lot of, um, I don't want to say drama, but so you had, you had all these people who've been in the industry for a long time, print industry, um, and now you had all these, I, I would assume, younger, fresh, energetic uh, people coming out of college and social media is blowing up. Um, did you have a little, uh, any issues there between each other? Oh, no, I, I didn't. Um, I really looked to those people for help, guidance. I mean, they were some of the finest, you know, across publications, people I worked with in the office. Um, and then, you know, I wasn't at Fortune for very long at all. Um, so when I was working at a startup, but still doing some freelance contributions to, you know, other websites, the slates of the world, places like that, um, the people I worked with, um, I had just a ton of admiration for. And I learned so much from them. You know, it, it, what you learn from an editor or a writer who's been in, uh, who's been in the industry and producing great content for, you know, 20 plus years, you know, when you were fresh out of college like me, you take every piece of advice you could get. So I'm sure I annoyed them uh, to high hell by asking tons and tons of questions, right? I'm sure they might have not loved that relationship, but I was just trying to absorb as much as I could. What was the toughest part for you at that point? I think for me, it was very shortly after I was out of college and I was, I was writing for fortune.com and um, you know, I had an offer to go join a startup, which I ultimately did. I, I joined a startup very quickly thereafter. And then my relationship with most of those publications became I was contributing freelance um, while working at the startup. And I think the question became like, well, is, is this going to be what I do? Am I the startup guy or am I going to try and make a career as like the magazine journalism guy, right? And again, this goes back to that being a time when people didn't even know what the future of magazine journalism was or if it had a future. So I think that contributed to my decision to go start up media outlet as a legacy brand. I think if I had graduated from college five years earlier, that might have been a very different calculus. You know what I mean? Um, but it was difficult. It was difficult weighing those things. It was difficult kind of recalibrating what I thought I could do in my career and, and the trajectory I, I thought it would take. Because, <coughs> pardon me, if you want to... Um, in, you know, there was a time when I thought, okay, you become a, a writer for a magazine, and then a staff writer, and then a senior writer, and then like an associate editor, and then an editor, and then a senior editor, and eventually, you know, when you're 50 some years old, you become the editor in chief, and boy, howdy, what a career! And no career in media is that well defined, and I learned and it is that point A to B to C, and I learned that pretty quickly on. But at the same time, moving more toward the startup realm was this sh mindset shift where I thought, well. There is no playbook. You know, there, there is no, I do this for a number of years and then I get promoted. I do this for a number of years and I get promoted and I work my way up the chain. It was more undefined and not knowing what route that could take or not having an idea can be very scary. And it, it was for me, certainly.
I was just going to ask you that. So uh, you're you're out of college. Uh, you were freelancing, working for a couple of magazines here and there, and then the the startup approached you. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. It was a uh, <clears throat> it was greatest g r a e t i s t dot com, which was actually founded by uh, someone I knew in college. So um, they they were a few years they were ahead of me in college, and they they had reached out to me. Um, early on in that site's development about getting involved. And then, um, you know, the offer of a, a full-time position was put on the table. And uh, it, 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 I probably took too long on that decision point um, because I was still trying to keep one foot in the world of writing for fortune.com and being there full-time and then one foot in kind of getting involved with that startup. But, you know, and anyone, anyone else at startups is that they're a lot of work and splitting your time Trying to do two things full time, you're not going to do either of them particularly well. So, um, yeah, that was that was definitely a, a factor there. So, wh where did where did Barbend come into play? Where where did this idea come uh, from? Yeah, Barbend was well. We were started. We started the company, and I'm I'm a co-founder of Barbend. So I have, I have two co-founders uh, in addition to me, who are fantastic. Uh, I'm very thankful for them. And we started in, in March of 2016, so almost exactly four years ago as of this recording, which is kind of crazy to think. Um, you know, I had been in the couple of years prior to that, basically the two, two and a half years prior to Barbend, I was actually um, consulting for a lot of different media brands and a lot of companies who had media components. So I did was doing work for some um, very big, like Fortune 500 companies who were launching blogs or had content components. And I was basically advising them on how to build content teams or helping them build content teams and included a lot of travel. I was traveling to exotic locations. I was kind of living this consulting, like fast paced lifestyle, spending a lot of time at conventions in, you know, Las Vegas and Miami and you name it. Um, and I knew that that probably wasn't sustainable for me long-term just because it was a lifestyle that was very go, go, go. And I really wanted to kind of settle back down and reestablish roots in New York city and, and spend the majority of my time here instead of just being on the road so much. And Barbend was kind of this idea that was always in the back of my head, even before it had a name, like, hey, what if we created a really high quality professional media outlet for strength sports that was news, analysis, opinion, op-ed, you name it. And I didn't find anything out there that I liked or that could scratch that itch when I had those questions or wanted to consume that content. So obviously, you know, entrepreneurially, you start thinking, well, if that doesn't exist, maybe I can just build it. The idea for a while, and it wasn't until I met my co-founders and started working on a few uh, consulting projects in 20 that um, you know I thought, hey, maybe this is the core of the team uh, that could do it. And I brought the idea to them, and you know they they were thrilled about it, and they are whip smart and had so many good ideas and levels of expertise and resources that I just didn't, and uh, you know the gaps kind of filled themselves in. It was like, okay, here's where I think. I can really succeed in building this brand, but I have these gaps and I don't have these core competencies that they have. And they can absolutely knock those sections out of the park, right? So together, we can come together and, and maybe build something really, really cool. Um, and we bootstrapped for almost the first year. We did, we did end up raising an initial round of funding to you know, hire more full-time uh, editorial and now videography. And we also produce podcasts and, and you name it. It's not just written anymore. It's, it's multimedia. But that's, that's a long-winded, short recap <laughs> of how Barbent came about. Who, did, did you have a love for strength sports or was it? Was oh, it, yeah. Yeah. I should, I should give some background there. So I was a, I was a, um, a competitive weightlifter for a bit, um, even after I wasn't doing that so competitively or actively anymore. I was very involved in the strength sports community. So I co-owned a gym for a while. Um, I uh, was active in the CrossFit community. I did some writing for uh, earlier for early versions of the CrossFit Games website, and I was working with their media teams and actually – boots on the ground at CrossFit Regionals, which is a level of qualification for the CrossFit Games that no longer exists. It's been replaced. But, um, you know, I would go to Regionals uh, every year and I would, uh, you know, cover that for whether it was CrossFit HQ or, or other media outlets. Um, and I was just very heavily involved in that community and still involved in the weightlifting community and began to meet people in the powerlifting and strongman communities. Um, and a lot of the concerns 
different brands uh, for these larger companies had to do with fitness. So it had to do with, okay, do we incorporate wellness programs into our corporate packages or um, do we have products that are more targeted toward the wellness market? What is the wellness market? What are the sub niches of the wellness market? So even before Barbed started, and Barbed is very much a website for a niche within a niche or a niche within a niche, however you want to say that word, you know, I was getting exposure to and helping a lot of other companies and, and thinkers and, and business people navigate the space, right? The fitness community is big and broad. What are the smaller slices of it? What are they like that's the same? What are they like that's, you know, what are the differentiating factors, et cetera? And, and where are those communities going to uh, contract and expand over the next few years? So, um, yeah, I definitely had a love for it. And I think it was a, a, the perfect storm of something I was personally passionate about, but also recognize a significant business opportunity, or at least thought. Now, with with um, strength sports, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. I'm sure you can talk about them. Um, you know, just thinking back, I've been involved. I love fitness. I love bodybuilding. So uh, that's my background. Uh, but when I always thought years and years and years ago about strength sports and power lifters, immediately pops in your head, you know, these real big, bulky, burly guys who drink beer all day and throw, you know, uh, kegs up on and big stones on things. But that's not the case. So if you go into a, a gym now, first of all, you see a lot of uh, female strength athletes. Um, yeah. And they are in shape. There is not they're not big, heavy, overweight people. Um, so could you could you kind of explain a lot about that? Well, it's worth noting that different strength sports have different weight categories, right? So, <clears throat> you know, what we, what you might have grown up seeing watching the world's strongest man on ESPN or ESPN2, right? So that still exists. It's still around. That's for an open body weight, that's an open body weight strongman competition for men. So the biggest and strongest people get as big and strong as you can. Um, and we cover that. We cover the world's strongest man very, you know, in depth on bar bend. Um, but most strength sports, including strongman, actually, has uh, categories for men and women and also weight classes in between that. So, for example, it's 2020. It's an Olympic year. Weightlifting, which is the snatch and the clean and jerk. That is the strength sport connect, contested in the Olympics. It's not powerlifting. It's definitely not bodybuilding. It's weightlifting, the snatch, the clean and jerk. There are bodyweight categories <clears throat> ranging from, you know, um, Smaller people to bigger people. You know, you will see people who weigh around 100 pounds competing against people who weigh around that weight. I'm, I'm doing the kilogram conversion because in most strength sports we use kilograms, but for, for the listeners, pounds might be easier. So I'm, I'm trying to do the conversions in my head real quick. You have 100 pound people competing against other 100 pound people, you know, roughly, and then you'll have 330 pound people competing against 330 pound people and all these different weight classes in between. So there are a lot of different body types. In strength sports, most strength sports are not about aesthetics. This is not bodybuilding. It's not figure competition. It doesn't matter how you look. It just matters how you lift. So you'll find a lot of different – some people might look like bodybuilders. And that's just because, you know, in training, their bodies had that reaction. But strength sports are not all bodybuilding. It's not about how you look. It's about how you lift. Um, so huge variations in body types. Women's strength sports is – they're, they're growing very rapidly. Pretty much every strength sports strength sport for women is growing rapidly. CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting, strongman. Um, I'd say from the beginning, CrossFit was heavily uh, split between the genders. It wasn't like it was 90% men and 10% women even at the beginning. So that's kind of had an ethos of equal coverage for men and women since it was a competitive sport. And that began about 13 years ago. Um, so, yeah, a lot of variation in strength sports. Um, a lot of people who, you know, if you see them on the street, you wouldn't necessarily think they were a world-class athlete, but, you know, they might have a couple Olympic gold medals hiding under their, you know, hiding under their jacket or something like that. So it's not about how you look. It's about how you show up and lift the weight. Cool. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, so does the strength sports have the, um, the chemical enhancement issues that, that, that bodybuilding may have? Oh that? yeah. I <laughs> Pardon me. No problem. There. And it wasn't because of that question. I've just been a little congested <laughs> today, I promise. So the answer is yes. Every elite sport has a relationship with issues with 
controversies around performance enhancers. It happens in bodybuilding. It happens in professional cycling. It happens in track. And it happens in weightlifting and powerlifting and CrossFit and strongman. It depends on the, the strictness of the drug testing depends on the federation, right? It depends on the governing body. So, for example, Barbend is the official media partner of USA Weightlifting. USA Weightlifting is the official governing body for the sport of weightlifting in the United States, which is under the U.S. Olympic Committee, which is under the International Olympic Committee. It's an Olympic sport. The testing, the drug testing is rigorous. It is, <clears throat> and there are severe penalties for positive drug tests. There are um, multi-year suspensions. There are lifetime bans. If a particular country has enough positives during a given period of time, that entire country's program can be suspended Oh, for wow. a length of time. <clears throat> we saw that happen to recently. Um, big, big weightlifting countries, including Russia and even China, actually, they were suspended from international competition for about a year. So big, big penalties, very strict drug testing. Um, you know, if you talk to anyone in uh, the U.S., you, if you talk to, talk to any elite weightlifter in the USA weightlifting system who's actually competing, like they'll tell you, drug testers will show up. They'll, they'll they won't give you much warning. They'll show up at your place of business. They'll show up at your gym. They'll show up at your home, and they'll test you. Um, it is it is very frequent. Now, there is also there are also certain federations of powerlifting that are very strict on drug testing, and there are some that don't drug test at all. You know, the same goes for uh, <clears throat> the same goes for strongman, and then CrossFit. Official CrossFit competitions are all under the auspices of, of, of CrossFit. Um, some of them are run by third parties, but it's all for qualification toward the CrossFit Games. And they have a very strict drug test policy. They have positive tests. You know, there was an athlete a few years ago who finished third at the CrossFit Games. It was a big deal. It was on the podium stand and was stripped of his medal because he tested positive for performance enhancers. Hmm. So... A lot of the news and controversy and, and things that come up in these sports do have to do with uh, performance enhance enhancements, the enforcement of penalties for banned substance tests, things like that. And a lot of it is controversial, right? Because there's some people who advocate for doing away with all drug testing and just letting athletes do whatever they want, right? They advocate that might level the playing field. There are people on the opposite end of the spectrum that say that would do the opposite of leveling the playing field. Um, and it could even endanger athletes. So it's a big part of these sports in that it's something that every competitive athlete and every federation has to at least address in some way, shape, or form. And, and really, that makes it not much any other major sport. You know, weightlifting might not get the same coverage at the Olympics as, you know, the 100-meter sprint, right? But... They both, like, one thing they share in common is that drug testing is always a topic of debate. If there is a high-profile positive, that's going to make the news. It's going to create conversation. So uh, it's a part of these sports for sure. Since, since you've been involved in strength sports and weightlifting, what, what changes have you personally seen? Yeah, I mean, I first got into weightlifting in 2009. And the growth in popularity of weightlifting and powerlifting and strongman and CrossFit has been, especially in the United States, but also internationally, has been phenomenal. A lot of that is due to the growth of CrossFit, by the way. CrossFit borrows movements and training methodologies and aspects from all these other strength sports. So more people today probably know what a snatch is and what a clean and jerk is and what a deadlift is because of CrossFit than almost any other singular factor. Right. And so in the, with the rise of CrossFit, it's kind of lifted the tide um, and lifted the, the, the ships have risen for all these other uh, sports, so to speak, because people are learning about these other sports. A lot of people start in CrossFit, but then they discover, hey, my favorite part of CrossFit is the weightlifting movements or, hey, my favorite part of CrossFit is the powerlifting movements. There's a, a, a very accomplished strongman competitor named Rob Kearney, who, who I consider a, a, a personal friend. We've had him on the Barbed podcast. He's a world, multi-time world's strongest man competitor. He found strongman through CrossFit, which at one time would have been unthinkable, right? But I think CrossFit has been 
one of the, if not the driving force of the increase in popularity of these sports. That's been fantastic. Another thing, but weightlifting and specifically, you know, 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago when I was first becoming interested in the sport, the United States was not doing well internationally. Um, we didn't win an Olympic medal in weightlifting between 2000 and 2016. Uh, we had we had one we had a, a woman win gold and a woman won a bronze win, win a bronze in 2000 and there was a 16 year gap before we had another Olympian win a bronze medal in 2016. The growth of CrossFit increased visibility for weightlifting in the United States, and I think that ultimately helped bolster the number of people exploring weightlifting in the United States. And I think that has really uh, also helped accessibility. Uh, for weightlifting equipment. So a lot of great weightlifting programs are actually run out of CrossFit gyms because they, they can share equipment and they um, have so much in common in that realm. So it's made weightlifting more accessible. And, you know, heading into the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, USA Weightlifting is looking at, you know, the prospect of maybe multiple medals, um, which is really something special and I think can trace its roots, at least in part, to the growth of CrossFit. Yeah, no, absolutely. What What misconceptions do you think the general public has um, about uh, strength athletes. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you touched on some of them, that they're all meathead bodybuilders, they're all, you know, guys who listen to Slayer, although there are plenty of those. Hey, no, no, hey, hey, listen to whatever gets you, whatever gets you lifting. Uh, they're all, you know, juiced up and full of steroids, and, um, and they're, you know, they're all, um, they're just these massive individuals, and you have to be gigantic, and kind of born strong in order to compete or get involved in these. And the other misconception I hate is that, you know, weightlifting is going to be bad. Squats are bad for your knees. You shouldn't squat. That's bad for your knees. You know what's really bad for your knees as you get older? Not doing anything. Exactly. That's for your knees. Sedentary lifestyle. That's horrible for your back. It's horrible for your knees. One of the misconceptions that we haven't touched upon that I hate is that, oh, these strength sports, you're going to have difficulty walking when you're older. <clears throat> You know, you're not, your knees are going to give out. Look, not everyone who gets involved in strength sports or strength training has the ultimate goal of putting a thousand pounds on the pounds on their back and trying to squat. Very few people in history have done that. Very few people in the world are capable of maybe doing that. Right. But strength sports as a mechanism to get active, to build muscle mass, to help fight the, the loss of muscle mass as you age, which is something that every human experiences and we have to actively work against, resistance training can be very good for you. It can improve mobility, not everyone's muscle bound. You wanna see some real flexibility? Watch weightlifters in the bottom of a snatch. You wanna see some cool mobility. Mobility is such a big, and flexibility are such big components of strength sports that I think are underrated. And, uh, in the general mindset, in the mainstream mindset. So the biggest misconception that we hadn't touched upon previously was that, you know, weightlifting is going to make you muscle bound and immobile and it's bad for you. That's, that's just not the case. Anything taken to an extreme can have negative repercussions. You can say that for elite marathoners. You can say that for cyclists. Uh, there's actually a lot of interesting info about how uh, elite cyclists actually have bone density issues. Um, you know, and and there are weight there are weightlifters and powerlifters who sure going after huge weights they do get injured right, uh, but for most people they can be extremely safe sports they can be extremely fulfilling they can improve longevity and especially as we age they can definitely improve quality of life if you're strong enough to squat well then you're going to have no issues getting up out of a chair bending over to pick something carrying your groceries playing with your Kids, grandkids, you know, these are sports you can have all your life. I know 80 year old CrossFitters. I've seen 85 year old weightlifters compete. There are there are categories for competition, not only for weight classes, but there are master's divisions for older folks. And these people are moving well, and they attribute a lot of that to regular strength training. Mm -hmm. And just in my gym, in my gym. Uh, you can go in and see people of all varying ages. I was on a treadmill the other day, and the guy next to me told me he was, I think he told me he was 89 years old. He looked, at least in his 50s, I mean, he looked amazing. It works out every day, um, you know, weightlifting and, and some cardio. So it's it's definitely out there. You should definitely go out and do something, not just sit around. Um, there's definite benefits to it. Mm -hmm. For sure. 
Uh, you're also on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which is uh, amazing. Um, how did that come about? Um, well, thank, thank you. For, uh, first off, uh, I applied. Uh, I self-nominated, which you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of like applying to college. They're, they're, a, they're a series of applications, and you need letters of recommendation, and they have uh, there are different lists, right? So I was on the, the 30 under 30 list for media. There are lists for venture capital. There are lists for music and entertainment. There are lists for food and cuisine. Or food and wine, I think, is technically the list. There are a bunch of different. There are lists for um, you know, banking. I think is is one of the lists. Um, and so, really, they're trying to assemble a class of what they call list makers, which is a, a funny term. And um, you know that is selected by. It's narrowed down by a pool of Forbes staffers, and then, to my understanding, the final decisions are made by um, guest judges who are you know prominent figures in those respective industry um so yeah the whole application process nomination application process took me five or six months it was not a, it was not a short thing there were a lot of different rounds of applications and questionnaires and letters of recommendation um but I, you know i'm th super thankful to have made it um it, it, it's quite the honor um it was a surprise to kind of it's funny I, I i try and get up pretty early to get the day started like i'm sure a lot of people do, but the, the day that the list was announced, the year I made it, uh, which was, I made the 2019 list that was announced in November 2018, I had slept in that morning, I had worked really late, emailed some people and been like, hey, I'm coming in a little late tomorrow morning, I've just been out, you know, working on this stuff, so I'm going to sleep in a little bit, so I woke up later than normal to a lot of texts and emails, and I didn't really understand what was going on at first, uh, but, you know, once I wiped the sleep out of my eyes, I was like, oh, oh, cool, cool, I thought there was some, like, massive emergency, uh, uh, but uh, I'm very, very to have uh, gone through that process and would definitely encourage anyone who's interested in um, checking out the resources that Forbes has online for how to apply uh, or how to self-nominate. If you want to self-nominate, you can also nominate others, of course. Um, it's just a lot of people don't, don't realize, I think, that you can self-nominate. So um, certainly a, a path there, and it, it, it worked for me. Did you celebrate or did you just go about your normal day? Well, uh, you know, Forbes has a, an under-30 conference in Detroit uh, is the location now. And I think it'll be in Detroit for the next few years at least. And so, you know, I made the list. I found out I made the list in November of 2018. And then in October of 2019, they had the actual conference, the under-30 conference in Detroit. And that was a big celebration, right? You, you, um, uh, there are tens of, like, I think they had tens of thousands of people or 10,000 people show up. It's, it's not just list makers. It's, it's. People who are there, connections and business people. Uh, it's a great business conference, and there are keynote speakers and concerts and exhibitions, and it's like this this big festival of entrepreneurship and business, and they have great food, and it's like it's this whole thing. Um, and going there as a list maker, they they really treat you like a VIP. You get like the special wristband, you get kind of access to everything. I had never been to Detroit before; I'd only flown through. I'd never like been to Detroit proper, so getting to explore the city a bit was great. I loved the food in Detroit. I'm actually working on planning another trip to go back either this summer or this fall because I had such a good time. Um, may go to the conference again in the future. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of the celebration and it was fun to be able to meet so many different people and, and be in a, a, a city that, you know, so many people counted as down and out, but has really experienced a resurgence. And it, it's cool that uh, Forbes hosts uh, this conference there because it just brings so many more people into the city and I'm really thankful that it gave me exposure to it. I don't think I would have experienced that. <laughs> cool. Um, so you're on the other end of, of a startup. You did it. Um, uh, you created it. You're doing it. You're living it. What do you tell other people who who have these, these dreams to, to actually make them happen? It's a big jump. It is a big jump. I would say... Uh, I am a proponent of, like, some people say, find your tribe or build your tribe. Um, I, you know, had the idea for Barbent for a while, but it didn't start until I found two co-founders who I trusted and who brought skills to the table that I just frankly didn't have and resources that I just didn't have. Um, the one thing I think that I would tell myself earlier about entrepreneurship is you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to be a singular founder, 
right? You don't have to be just one person going at it. Um, it's okay to share your ideas and it's okay to wait a little bit to find someone or some ones uh, who share your passion for an idea and are, are willing to uh, venture into that with you. Did you did you have a lot of struggles together? Oh 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 yeah. I mean, you know, we still have struggles. We're still we're still a relatively small, relatively young company. You know, it's we we worry about keeping the lights on. We worry about. I mean, we're not not. That's a. a we don't actually worry about keeping the lights on, but like you know, as an entrepreneur, you're always wondering about. Uh, a revenue and well, I want to hire more people, but we got to make sure that we, you know, have enough revenue for that. We have to make sure that we don't over hire and that we don't hire the wrong people. And I have to make sure that the people who are here are happy and feel empowered to do their best jobs and they have the resources they need. Uh, so struggles are, are constant. You don't get into entrepreneurship if you if you don't if you aren't comfortable with a certain level of stress, right? Because it's stress every day, right? There's there's stress every day. Ultimately, you're the last line of defense. There's no one else to really point the finger at if something goes catastrophically wrong. Um, so uh, the struggles never stop in entrepreneurship, and that is something I've heard from, you know, first-time early-stage founders all the way up to people who are running big public companies and maybe started those companies, right? It, it, the struggles are always there, and um, as you grow, the problems the in type and and uh, amount that the problems will probably increase. Hopefully, your team grows with the company in order to be able to better tackle those problems. But you know, they 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 happen. If I walked around your office today and uh, talked to some of your coworkers and people around town there, uh, what would they tell me about you? Uh, they'd tell me I probably need a haircut. At this point, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I tell you that that. Um, I don't know. That's a tough question. It's hard. You can't be objective about yourself, right? I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there are things they say, or at least I'm sure there are less than lovely things, right? Uh, it's very tough to be objective about yourself. Uh, and, uh, you know, you hope it's more lovely things than not so lovely things, but, you know, no one's perfect. And some days I'm, I'm sure I'm more of an ogre than I am a nice guy. So, uh, you know, it really probably depends. What do you like to do outside of work? Or, or are you working all the time? I, I like to stay busy. I stay busy, you know, at the barbend office. Um, but you know, outside of, of work, I do enjoy working out. Uh, it's a big part of you know what we do here, but also just part of my lifestyle. Um, I do some voice acting on the side and some voiceover work on the side. Actually, a lot of that time has been kind of subsumed behind the barbend podcast and the audio work we've been doing in the office. So it's kind of the side gig that became part of the main thing. Um, and. Uh, you know, living in New York, you have just endless, endless options for things you can go do. Um, and so sometimes the issue is not finding things to do. It's, it's limiting myself to make sure I have those opportunities to rest and recover and reflect. Because if you wanted to do two different things every night in New York City for the rest of your life and never do the same thing twice, you certainly could. Um that's just the nature of the of the beast. So I think sometimes it's it's making sure I have that unstructured time uh, to balance out and have a little reflection and quiet time. That's something that I've been really working on lately. How'd you get involved with voice acting? Uh, it, you know, it was um, something that a, an audio engineer friend of mine suggested I look into. I'd done a little bit of sports color commentary through Barbend actually, um, and decided to give it a go. And I will say I'm, I'm very much a, a hobbyist, an amateur. Um, I, do get, I do get paid uh, for, for some of the work. So actually, I, I guess that is the definition of professional if you're, if you're paid for it. But, you know, it is not my day job. Uh, there are people who I'm very close with in New York City and across the country who um, are super impressive and, and do that as their primary source of income. And, you know, they are leaps and bounds and light years ahead of, of where I am. Um, but it is something that I try and dedicate a little bit of time to as far as auditioning and, and, and making connections in and, and doing some gigs at least a little bit every month. Um, it's been a really, really cool way to meet people, you know, outside, still in the media community, but outside of the media community where Barbed exists. Cool. You said um, you brought two other partners in because uh, they brought to the table some other things that you don't you don't actually have for yourself. What, what are your struggles? 
personally. My struggles personally, uh, yeah, I say the two part. I you know you say that the two partners brought I uh, brought them in, but really I I it's I think we brought each other uh, together, and they they in many ways brought me in. Um, is I think worth just worth specifying there. And obviously, very thankful for that. You know, my um, struggles are I have an editorial background. I did not have the business development background or chops that I think I have today. Early on, uh, I am not super technical. I'm not a developer. I am not going to be able to whip up, you know, a quick plugin to fix something on a website um, or to be able to best manage the developer who does that. Right. A lot of those technical skills and technical chops, I'm still not very great at. Um, and and there have been huge on that end as well as advice on the business development side. Um, I don't have the best eye toward design. I got to be honest. And in the early days, you know, we didn't have full time graphic designers at Barbat. So a lot of the early design decisions were made collaboratively and my ideas sometimes thankfully lost because I just don't have the best eye for it. And I think especially one of my business partners especially has a fantastic eye toward uh, design and, and color, especially on uh, mobile devices. So, um, you know, uh, I could go on about my business, but those are just a few of the highlights. Well, what, about, what are you awesome at? I'm sure there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I've built, I don't know if awesome is the right word, but, you know, I'm pretty comfortable building and managing editorial teams. Um, you know, I make sure content gets up. Um, I, I make sure, uh, I try to make sure the writers feel heard um, and uh, pretty good at, at working with writers to get them comfortable producing content in the space because, you know, it's not like you can go out and hire a lot of strength sports journalists with a decade of experience because those people don't really exist. You know what I mean? We... Um, at Barbend, we basically take in journalists and writers who might have an interest in strength sports and work with them to build them into strength sports journalists. Hmm. And so figuring out how to do that and that training process um, has been a learning experience for everyone, but something I'm, I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish with our team. What are your What are your goals and the company's goals for 2020? What, do we, what can we look forward to? Our goals for this year are a, a few things. Um, we've seen a, a significant traffic increase so far in 2020, which is great. Um, we want to increase the presence of our podcast and video uh, arms. Uh, we want to release uh, more sub-branded podcasts. We want to work more on the video side. We want to explore more sponsored content with brands, which we've done a bit of, but we want to do more multimedia-driven uh, spon multimedia sponsored content. And then I think our team's going to grow. I think 2020 is going to be um, have at least one or two significant hiring periods for us and I think our team's going to grow somewhat significantly uh, later this year and um, that's going to be a huge focus and demand a lot of all of our attention to make sure we find the right people and to make sure they have the resources they need to really succeed. Nice. All right. Well, that's it, David. I, I, I had a great time talking to you. Could you tell us where we can find you? Obviously at Barbend. And I'm going to put all your links up and wherever else you'd like us to promote. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, barbent.com and, you know, Barbent on most social media channels. Personally, I'm at D underscore Tao on Twitter, D underscore T-A-O. And I'm at David Thomas Tao on Instagram. So you can find me there. Cool. I really appreciate it. This was really, uh, really great to talk to you and talk about weightlifting. And maybe we can talk about bodybuilding sometime. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me on. Cool. Thank you, Dave. I'll talk to you soon.